Uh, thank you very much, Professor Colin. Um, uh, first of all, thank you for your uh, kind invitation, and it has been a great pleasure for me so far. Uh, knowing I will be speaking after Professor Pauli gave me mixed feelings. On the one hand, Professor Pauli has simply set the bar too high for me to follow. On the other hand, uh, he has made my job much easier because he has covered, already covered so much on China's fishery. So I can simply say, as Professor Pauli has mentioned in previous presentation. Nevertheless, uh, my presentation will be focusing more on the domestic politics and geopolitics aspect of China's fishery, particularly in the context of uh, regional maritime dispute in the South China Sea and East China Sea. So let me begin by providing a few uh, examples about the rising number of fishing incidents which has become triggers for even bigger diplomatic and security clashes between China and its neighbors in recent years. Uh, it started with the 2010 uh, fishing boat collision incidents with Japan, which has severely deteriorated or damaged uh, Sino-Japanese relations. And then in the South China Sea, uh, you had a 2012 Scarborough Shore standoff uh, caused by the uh, Philippine Navy's attempt to arrest Chinese fishermen. And then you had a 2014 Hub Moon Shore incident and uh, the, with the Philippines, and also the 981 oil rig incident with Vietnam, and 2016 uh, Natuna fishing incident. This is some of the example, uh, pictures about the incidents in Southeast China Sea. And then this is the Scarborough Shore and uh, Natuna incident. This is the oil rig incident in 2014. Uh, you have dozens of fishing vessels from both sides encircling and ramping each other, resulting uh, in, in the sinking of the Vietnamese fishing vessel. Against this backdrop, uh, this context, in, or in this context, you have security experts or scholars, the ones that the clashes over fishing rights or fishing resources poses the greatest potential risk for triggering a full-fledged crisis or even armed conflicts in the South China Sea. Thus, f to prevent this kind of fishing incidents from reoccurring, a better understanding of the factors that make fishermen, particularly the Chinese fishermen, and the front line of the regional maritime dispute is thus critical. Many Western scholars and uh, commentators has, has attributed this to a very simple narrative or factor. The Chinese government has been militarizing uh, politicizing is fishermen, and these fishermen are not fishermen, actually, they are militia. They are the prongs of the POE Navy, um, undertake or doing the dirty works for the government. Hence, you have numerous reports uh, on this topic. Not only general article, uh, 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 news articles, you have general articles uh, appearing, covering the same issue, or making the same statement. And then, very big concern is that you have US Navy, the Pentagon, has recently, or uh, just uh, in last year, has published a report, uh, explicitly uh, mentioned China's maritime militia as a security threat. And also, the Japanese defense white paper made a similar, a similar uh, statement. Um, my view is that there's no denial the South China Sea climate states, particularly Vienna and China, has long considered fishermen important tools in asserting or defending their claims in the South China Sea. And the maritime militia has been a long-standing policy of China and Vietnam. And in recent years, you see Philippines has made effort to establish their own version of maritime militia uh, in the South China Sea. And the, in 2013, during Xi President Xi Jinping's visit to Taiwan, he had met and pressed Taiwan fishing militia's effort in defending China's claim or uh, maritime interest uh, in the South China Sea. And he said, the South China Sea Islands has been China's territory since ancient times, and you, by referring the to the fishermen, has been the leading force and vanguard of in safeguarding China's maritime interest in the South China Sea. And since President Xi's visit, um, efforts at, uh, from various coastal cities has been put to 
develop the Montana militia forces. Similarly, uh, Vietnam has a uh, very strong maritime militia force, and various support has been provided. And uh, it has the so-called Militia and Self-Defense Force Law, uh, which we revised in 2009. However, this maritime militia of people's war uh, narrative offers very, at least, or at best, partial explanation. And it has major weaknesses, such as the maritime incident involving Chinese fishermen does not only occur in the disputed waters in the South China Sea. In fact, if you look at the numbers and also the extent of violence, the most of the fishing incidents involving Chinese fishermen uh, happened in the, in the Yellow Sea with the Korean, and even in the South China Sea um, it was, uh, Taiwan, with Taiwan. And also, even in the, South, uh, in the disputed water in South China Sea and East China Sea, the location of incidents that happens are not always in the disputed areas. And also, this maritime militia narrative or people's war narrative they overlooked the much complicated relationship between states, local government, and the fishermen. Uh, here are just examples about the fishing incidents involving Chinese fishermen in, uh, with Taiwan and uh, with South Korea. You see the machine gun has been used to to, uh, to target China's fishermen in the South China Sea, in the Yellow Sea. And even in the case of the Philippines, uh, with the Philippines in the South China Sea, the Chinese fishermen, they know they, are, they, are, they were fishing illegally, that's why they fly the Philippine flag, but the problem is that they fly the flag upside down. And also, a lot of all these narratives based on evidence that the Chinese government has been providing very substantial financial support in terms of fishing fuel subsidy to the fishermen. But if you look at the details of the fishing fuel subsidy policy, it has nothing to do with uh, the ongoing, or has very little to do with the ongoing fishing maritime dispute with the neighbors. Hence, um, from my own view, I think it is important to situate uh, the degree in fishing is within the context of the development of regional fishery, particularly that of China. And behind the green fishing incidents, I think uh, are, the, well, the key factor is that there are three major structure shifts that attribute uh, to the green fishing incidents. The first is from inshore to offshore. The second is development of the distant water fishing. And the third, and very importantly for the South China Sea and East China Sea dispute, is uh, from traditional fishing to illegal harvesting of endangered species, including red coral, giant clams, sea turtles, etc. Um, I will quickly go through it, but I think it has been well mentioned by Professor Pauli. So you have this structure shift from inshore to offshore. If you look at the official statistics, the trend is, has been ongoing, but the problem is that since 2002, the national, at the national level, the Chinese government stopped publishing the data, but at a local level, uh, pointing to consistent uh, structure shift from inshore to offshore, and also the development of marine fishery, uh, the distant water marine fishery sector, uh, distant water fishing. Of course, the data has been quite problematic, but if you look at the number of vessels according to official data, uh, it has reached 2,900 by 2016, and uh, uh, a few hundred more are under construction. Uh, this is some of the uh, distant water fishing vessels I was trying to help. <laughs> they unloaded the squid from Argentina. Uh, this is a very big transshipment ship. And the third structure ship is from uh, traditional fishing to poaching of endangered species. Uh, in particular, red coral in East China Sea and uh, giant clans in South China Sea. The reason why um, red corals and giant clans have been quite popular in China recent years, part of it is because of religious reasons. Um, you see these very beautiful um, products made by red coral and very expensive vines. Uh, also, is a symbol of social status in Chinese culture, a red coral product. Um, 
what should be noted is that um, while red coral poaching is illegal in China, or sales is illegal in China, it has been very, is a very big industry in Taiwan. This is some of the picture I took during my field research trip in Taiwan. And uh, this one here in particular, the, um, on your right, uh, it values at 2 million RMB. So you have reports that uh, fishing vessels that harvest red coral for a living can make up to 100 million a year. So this substantial financial profit has motivated many of the so-called fishermen uh, from China, Taiwan uh, to engage in very dangerous behaviors. And also in the case of giant clans, um, similar trend. Uh, but this is mainly in the southern part of China, uh, China Hainan, Taiwan. Uh, these are some of the pictures I took during my trip to Taiwan. Um, uh, sea turtle. Hence, if you look at what happened, really happened in 2012 and 2014 with the Philippines, is that the Scarpro incident started when the Philippine fishermen tried to arrest those fishermen who were actually harvesting giant clans in the Scarborough Shore. And also in the, in the half, moon, half Moon Shore incidents, the fishermen were arrested for, for the Philippine side said they were harvesting, but in fact, those fishermen were buying the, giant, uh, the sea turtles from the Filipino fishermen. Uh, the, there has been this informal trade between China and regional fishermen in the South China Sea has been ongoing for many years. Uh, from giant clan to sea turtle and other marine products. Um, with astonishing returns, large inflow of social capitals and also government support, uh, Taiwan fishermen has been uh, started, has started building bigger and better ships which are capable of uh, going further or even farther in the South China Sea. Uh, here are some of the ships you can see from Taiwan's fishing port. But the problem is that a resulting growing number of fishing incidents and also devastating impact on the marine ecology. And uh, the, the structure shift of China's marine fishery sector are driven, I would say, uh, and state level is by food security concerns and uh, on a local and uh, fishermen level is by economic factors. For China's um, as far as China's fishing uh, policy is concerned, I would say there are five primary objectives that the government wish to pursue or intend to pursue. The first and most important is ensuring self-sufficiency of fishery products. And then you have to generate, uh, the second one is generate incomes for the fishermen and earning re uh, for reserves. And, and third, you have the political and strategic importance of fishery, which has been discussed or demonstrated through previous slides uh, in the earlier part. And of course, marine environment is also important. But in ideal situation, these five objectives, it was right mix of policies can be achieved uh, instant, at the same time. But in reality, the government faces uh, the, the choice of which one to prioritize. And in the, uh, so uh, during different period, um, you have different, uh, at least according to government policies, different priorities were set. While there are a lot of uh, problems with China's official data, but what we can infer from the official data is uh, the government's priority during different period. Um, Professor Pauli has mentioned during the early growth period, you have ser very serious over-reporting because the government considers expansion of marine production critical to the food security and basic economic well-being, uh, economic uh, well-being of the citizen. And then, since uh, late to 1990, uh, late 1990s, government began to play, uh, introduce this so-called zero negative growth policy uh, until 2000. And then, what happened between 2000 and 2015 it, it is that you have China's fishery or marine fishery entered a new growth period, but this period only lasts for five years. Uh, uh, from my perspective, and then currently uh, China entered the second control of uh, zero negative growth period. Um, between 
a bit, the 11th or 12th five-year plan, which is between 2001 to 2010, if you look at uh, those five-year plans, the government has explicitly put uh, a reduction of uh, fishery output as mandatory target. But it, this, uh, this camp was removed uh, during the 12th five-year plan. So the reason why you have, uh, you, uh, have a second growth period between 2011 and 2015, uh, for me, I think, is because of the convergence of interest among different um, actors and fisheries, and marine fishery became, uh, has been considered by the government as a strat of strategic importance uh, for full scale reasons, for economic reasons, for uh, geopolitical reasons, and for uh, political reasons. And the first and the most important one is the food security reason. It all started with the global food crisis in 2007 and 2008, which uh, triggered or prompted uh, the discussion or eventually adoption of the so-called blue granary strategy. Um, also, uh, the problem associated with the Anquan culture. I uh, think it has been mentioned by Professor Pauli, China's uh, rapid expansion of China's Anquan culture sector has put heavy pressures on the marine fishery sector uh, for f through fish feed, pollution, etc. And also because of the rising concerns, so safety concerns of fishery products, particularly farmed fishery products, the consumer, especially the wealthy ones, are willing to pay higher price for the wild marine catch, which provides strong incentives uh, for the fishermen to build and bigger and better ships. This is the picture I took uh, during my visit uh, to Fujian. Those sh f sh small fish are for feed uh, in local fish farms. And according to the uh, Greenpeace report last year, uh, the Anquan culture's reliance on um, trash fish uh, has been, been very st astonishing, actually. Uh, here are just some of the numbers. I will not read it, but there are some of the so-called small fish targeted. And then uh, in 2000, it has, it has been going on for years because the concerns about the safety aspect of the red meat, the government has been promoting, um, uh, encouraging the consumers to consume more uh, fish products. Uh, while the central government are more concerned about uh, food safety aspect, local government are more worried about economic impact and also uh, local employment. Apart from direct employment, um, you have the shipbuilding sector uh, that rely on uh, after its recession in the early 2000, in 2001, 2012, 2012, 2011. Um, many see building, fish building sector, ship, fishing vessel building sector, a solution to the overcapacity of China's shipbuilding sector, and also you have. Uh, China has the largest uh, sheep processing industry, which is underutilized because of lack of input. It put on pressures uh, for the marine industry, uh, marine fish industry as well. And then you have the Marine Silk Road, Build and Road Initiative. Marine Fishery Corporation has been one of the key areas. Uh, just now, just now I mentioned about the, the the link between shipbuilding sector with marine fishery industry. In fact. Uh, in 2012, what happened is that 27 academics from uh, uh, Chinese uh, um, Academy of Engineering, they supported a proposal, they submitted a proposal to the Chinese Ministry of Agriculture, which then resubmitted this proposal to the State Council, um, advocating to make marine fishery a strategic sector. One part of the reason is they argue is because this can be a solution to China, to, uh, can utilize the the, the, the excess capacity in China's fishing industry back then. And then uh, this proposal was adopted at, uh, in t February 2013. The State Council held its first meeting on marine fishery and then very quickly issued the country's uh, the first ever advice on promoting sustainable and healthy marine fishery development. This is the first ever uh, document issued by the State Council on marine fishery. 
it has spelled uh, detailed uh, principles and uh, policy support for the entire marine fishery sector. And then what is interesting is that if you look at the statement, uh, this document, it clearly states that China should control inshore fishing, expand offshore fishing, and develop or develop distant world fishing. And uh, be during this period, a huge amount of financial support has been provided uh, to marine fishery sectors. Here are just some of the examples about all the fish, uh, financial support provided by the Chinese government uh, to the marine fishery sector. Uh, this is the fishing fuel subsidy for, the, uh, for fishing in the South China Sea in the spread lease. And so within a few years, you have this remarkable transformation of the fishing um, marine fishery sector in many parts of China, from traditional to modern big vessels. With bigger and better vessels, uh, more and more Chinese fishermen now can go further into the seas, um, not only in disputed waters, but in other countries' easies and also high seas. And the second period, however, the problem is that the second expansion period ended quickly because uh, the government, the central government, became aware of the environmental, social, and even political cost associated with China marine fishing industry. For instance, in the 2016 uh, the arbitration award on the South China Sea dispute, uh, the arbitration award clearly mentioned the Chinese fishermen's very damaging behavior uh, in the South China Sea, in the spread trees, harvesting giant clans, sea turtles, etc., which has damaged China's international reputation and image. Hence, since 2016, um, I would say it entered the second control period. Um, one part of the reason is that under Ch Chinese President Xi Jinping's leadership, ecological civilization has become a guiding principle, development principle uh, for China. And uh, Xi Jinping con uh, conceptualized EC as green mountains and waters are good, um, silver mountains. And so it, it says that protecting of the marine environment is important. Uh, marine, protecting of the environment and natural resources in general are as important as uh, economic development. And then a few months ago, China has set up this new ministry uh, to, protect, uh, develop, to protect the sustainable development of its natural resources. And then just two days ago, um, on the 47th World Environment Day, Xi Jinping, now this article has been widely circulated in Chinese state media and also social media. Social media. To Xi Jinping, environmental protection is the fundamental principle. Hence, um, you see a lot of effort has been taken by the Chinese government to address various problems associated with marine fishing. We started with, with IU fishing, uh, uh, effort taken by Chinese government on IU fishing, which actually predates uh, 2016. But in any case, um, and also a serious effort to crack down the giant clan business in Taiwan. The whole industry was closed overnight um, since earlier last year. But the problem is that the so-called black market is still um, flourishing because of huge demand. And then you have various policies to reduce, uh, to put a, re -put a cap on marine catch production, a number of fishing fleet, and also uh, very importantly, China has been decided to uh, catch the notorious fish and fuel subsidy. By, f to, uh, by 2019, the, number of, the amount of fish and fuel subsidy to the fishermen will be reduced to 40% level of that in 2014. And then on the fish, distant water fishing sector as well, uh, in, la in December last year, according to the 13th five-year plan, the government will, put a, uh, will restrict the number of distant water, uh, water fishing to 3,000 3, and also the number of distant water fishing companies. And also the policies was introduced to address problems associated with agriculture. The re expan domestic expansion of agriculture uh, will be controlled and uh, China has made it, uh, made it a priority to develop the more culture or distant sea farming. And what is, for me, is even more fundamental is that the Chinese government has ditched the principle of self-sufficiency uh, in fishery products, uh, which is in line with the overall 
paradigm shift in the country's food security strategy. And uh, increasingly, you see Chinese government has been reducing the fishery, uh, the tariffs on fishery products import, and also signing uh, fishery trade deals with a number of countries such as Norway, Jamaica, Mald Maldives, and Indonesia. And it uh, encouraged these companies to, uh, Professor Poli has mentioned in the past, you know, one third of the Disney water catch sold locally, and one third to, de to the developed countries, a certain market, and then, but now, or has been going on for years, the Chinese government has encouraging its different water fishing companies to bring back their catch to meet the rising demand for domestic market. However, the problem is that how effective this policy will be, or this effort um, will remain, uh, remain to be seen due to various challenges. The first is the demand side challenge. Um, and also you have the supply side too many fishing vessels. Uh, regarding the uh, demand side, the, the typical example is the giant clam and the red coral beans. Because when you still have, when you have rising demand for these products, the, the, your action taken to deal with the supply side will only get the price even higher. Higher price will motivate more fishermen to go further and also uh, trade or purchase from other countries as a case of, because uh, when the Chinese government take actions against red coral beans, a lot of Chinese uh, consumers that went to Taiwan to, pr to buy the radical products. And also, in the case of giant clan, once, uh, when the moment when the Chinese government started to crack down the Taiwan's giant clan business, you see reports saying giant clan was smuggled from Vietnam to China via land borders. Um, and also, uh, with the blue granary strategy, uh, the, the more culture, the feed is still a big challenge. Uh, with rising demand, uh, these, uh, uh, I think, and at least according to some estimate, may be different from uh, uh, other sources, but there, it is projected that the Chinese total demand for fishery product will continue to grow, and uh, this rising demand will be, in the future, will be made mainly through uh, import. Um, this um, will have far-reaching consequences on the global fishery trade, and fishery production, but from a different, uh, different uh, perspective. Thank you very much.